Well, I certainly didn't expect to talk after Steve Jobs, actually, so... <laughs> let me start by asking you something. Could you, just for a few seconds, imagine what the Europe of your dreams look like? And once you have done that, what are you going to do to make it happen? It's a tough question, right? Especially for our generation. You cannot Google it. So let's see what the previous generation had in mind. What was their dream about Europe? When, for instance, if you ask my, fa my parents' generation, they will all answer to you one word. Peace. And they did it. Indeed. They managed to turn a region, Western Europe, devastated by war for the past centuries, into a peaceful union. And today, we are still enjoying this, the longest period of peace in the history of that region. How did they do that? Well, what did you need to make war at that time? Two things, steel and coal. So what they did is put the production of steel and coal of the different enemy countries under a single supranational authority. And that was the first draft of the European Union. And not only it prevented war, but it made the production of steel and coal more competitive. And this, together with peace, contributed to the prosperity of that region. Wow, what an achievement. So what about us? What about our generation? What are we going to do to transform Europe? Of course, the situation has nothing to do. We cannot even compare it. But still, there are many challenges ahead. How are we going to create employment to replace those who have gone abroad? How are we going to stop global warming and protect the environment? How are we going to find new forms of energy, preserve our social model, improve human rights, deal with an aging population? There are many, many challenges. But whatever your dream of Europe is, whatever the challenge, there's a great deal of chance that you will need at least one thing, and that thing is innovation. And the good news is there are plenty of passionate, creative, innovative people out there, and in here, I'm sure, too. Just like, remind me of uh, Alexandre Ramelin, French engineer with two friends. His passion is sailing. So he decides that he wants to improve his boat. And what he does, he creates a new method to create parts of the boat that are made of composite material to make it go faster. Well, the new method he created just for out of passion got the interest of the aircraft industry. And today, Alexandre and his two friends are the head of a company directly working with Airbus and major aircraft companies. You see it as the key about innovation. Not only transform your dreams into reality, but you make a living out of it. And not only that, <coughs> but it's useful for society, it's useful for the environment. Thanks to Alexandre Method, for instance, planes will be lighter, so they will consume less, CO less fuel and they will emit less CO2, and they will make less noise. But that's not all, and especially in time of crisis, Alexandre managed to create 40 jobs. Not bad. So it looks like our challenges will be faced. Huh? It's, uh, it looks like everything is going all right. We have the challenges. We have the innovative, creative, passionate people. So let's go. Let's solve the problems. Well, no, sorry. That's not how it works. Because innovation is not a natural process. The fact of turning ideas into something real, into products or services, is not something that happens by itself. It needs a very specific environment. It needs an innovation-friendly environment in order to flourish. Just give you an example. Noam, a Swedish uh, entrepreneur, he created a company in the Silicon Valley on e-commerce. And he comes back to Europe and when I ask him, how is it going? Is business okay? He says, well, you know, not bad, but it's hard to find people with the right skills in Europe. So I have a hard time recruiting people. Hmm. 
And he says to, you know, patents are so expensive, you know, compared to the U.S. Hmm. And he finished, and whenever I have to go to another country in Europe to expand my business, I have to face a whole lot of new regulation. It's very time consuming. It prevents my business to expand. So you see, no matter how passionate and good you are, if the environment is not right, it will be hard to make your business. And that's the reason why all together, all the member states in the European Union, the European institution, the private sector, the NGOs, the research world, we should all work together to create this innovation-friendly environment. Just like our parents did. They all work together, they pool their efforts to create this peaceful union. But this time it's not steel and coal that we need to pool. It's knowledge and means to transform this knowledge into something useful. And this is exactly what the Innovation Union is about. It's about making Europe, turning Europe into an innovation-friendly environment. So what I'm going to do now is tell you in 10 points how you do that. The real initiative shared by the European Union is much more complicated, of course. Huh? For those who thought, wow, the European Commission made something simple, well, no, sorry. It's much more complex. <laughs> so, in 10 points, I will just outline them. If you want to see the real stuff, you go on the website, huh? as we say. First, just like in Noam's example, we need people with the right skills. So we need to invest in education. Member states should invest in education. Not only that, they should invest in research and development because we need ideas to be created if we want to turn them into product and services. Did you know, by the way, that the countries that invested the most in research and development are the ones that are getting out of the crisis the faster today? Wow, what a miracle, no? You give vitamins and antibiotics to a sick person, the person recovers faster. Who knew? Well, innovation, research and development are like one of the antidote against the crisis, so we better invest in them. Producing ideas is good, but we should have access to them, open access. We all, as taxpayers, were already paying for most of the public-funded research. So why should we pay a second time to get access to the publication, for instance? We need public access for all public-funded research data. Investing in researcher is very good. It's essential. But we also need to let them move around Europe freely so they can collaborate with whomever they want and whomever they think is suitable for their research. It reminds me of uh, Irina Stoinova, a Bulgarian lady. All her life, she wanted to help people, so she became a researcher in neurodegenerative disease. You know, those diseases like Alzheimer or Parkinson. Maybe we have relatives that are suffering for this devastating disease. So she has a brilliant idea to open a new way for potential new treatment. But in Bulgaria, she doesn't have the mean or the people to collaborate with. But fortunately, she managed to have a European grant, the Marie Curie grant, to move to the Netherlands. And now she's developing these new ideas. And maybe one day, because it's, of course, fundamental research, but maybe one day this will come up to a new treatment that maybe you and I will need one, of the, one day. So we better let researchers move around Europe and collaborate in order for them to find solutions to our problems. And that's exactly why we are creating this European research area. Free movement of knowledge, free movement of researcher. What else do we need to create this innovation union? We need cheap patents. Do you know how much costs a patent today in Europe to have a European patent? More than 30,000 euro. And most of the money goes to translation only. Well, when you'll have the unitary European patent, it will cost you around 680 euro, 80% 80 off. It's sales, permanent sales. That's a good news. Standard. We also need to have fast standards and renew the success of the GSM standard. You might not have noticed, but you go to with your mobile phone everywhere in Europe, you don't need to change mobile because the standard is the same, because it was set up very quickly. 
It's not like the electrical appliance when you go to the UK, you have to have adapters, etc. So we better have fast standards, especially in the case of the electric car, because if every country has a different plug, you won't go very far with your electric car, right? Regulation. Regulation are extremely important. They are protecting us. We create them to uh, make sure the system works well. But there is a whole lot of regulation that are outdated. So let's get rid of them. Let's screen for all the regulation that we don't need and that prevent innovation. What else do we need? We need money, of course. And venture capitalists. And we should make the life of venture capitalists a bit easier because today, if they want to levy money in another country than their own, they have to face a whole administrative burden. So let's remove these barriers. Let's let the venture capitalists levy money wherever they want to in Europe and invest in the innovative people. That will help a lot. Private sector money is, of course, essential, but it's not enough. For those who have tried, if you go to a venture capitalist and ask, yeah, I have a great idea, will you fund me? Say, yeah, sure. Come back when you have your product and your first client. Before that, sorry, but I won't take the risk. And he's right. The private sector cannot afford to take the risk in part of this innovation system. So that's why we need public funding also, so desperately. We need public funding not only for fundamental research, but also for uh, research, well, activities that are closer to the market, like demonstration, prototypes, support SMEs. Well, actually, the example I gave you of Alexandre and Irina, they were all funded by public funds. So we better give them public funding if we want them to find solutions for us. And that's exactly what the next program for funding of uh, research and innovation will be. It's Horizon 2020. One last point I want to make before I finish, maybe the most important, is if we want to create this innovation union, we need to change mentalities. We need to change the way we work. And the first was to change would be the public sector. You know that the public sector is handling a lot of money, right? They are spending money on your social security, uh, roads, police, hospitals, many things. So why not turning a part of this money into an innovation booster? How do you do that? Well, just like this health organization, the Rotterdam Trust Foundation in the UK did. They needed to buy products like the public sector has to do always. They need to buy products and services. And they wanted to renew their lightning system to become a hospital of the future. But they couldn't find what they wanted on, their, on the catalog. They wanted a lightning system that is efficient, low consumption, and very good quality for the patient. But it was not offered on the catalog. So they did something revolutionary. They ask for it. They ask for something that didn't exist. And guess what? They deliver it to them. So they didn't ask for a product. They ask for an output. They ask for a lighting system with the criteria of low consumption, good quality for the patient, and easy maintenance. And when they ask the company, but why didn't you deliver that before? The company answered, but you never asked before. It's as easy as that. If all the money that the public sector is using to buy products and services to companies would be used to boost innovation, Europe would be much better off. But it's not only the public sector that has to change. It's also the research world. And for instance, I've talked to you about this innovation system, right? It's a complex system that needs a very specific environment. Well, maybe most of you have in mind an innovation chain whereby you have uh, researchers in their lab creating knowledge, then the entrepreneur comes and gets this knowledge, 
and then create a product that is put on the market and then the consumer or the patient will buy it or not. Well, why not changing the way we work? Why not having the patient, the end users, the consumer, go and ask the researcher what they need? Why not having the companies go and ask the researchers what type of data they need to, to create their product? That's called demand-driven research and demand-driven innovation. So let's put all these people together in one room, researchers, regulators, uh, entrepreneurs, patient organization, consumer organization, and let them find solution to our problems all together. And that's exactly what we are doing is European Innovation Partnership. We are doing that on water, healthy aging, uh, raw materials, smart cities, and agriculture. So these are the 10 points. You might not remember them, huh? but I've done my job. So let's work on them. Everyone has his part to play. And let's see if it works. And maybe one day, just like we are grateful to our parents for having created this peaceful union, maybe one day our kids will be thankful to us for having created an innovation union. Thank you very much.